This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In the summer of 1745, a young man in a small French frigate landed on the west coast of Scotland. He had seven followers, some of them Irish, among his shipmates, and took to the Highlands to raise an army from the Scottish clans. The Highland clans, with sword in hand, for a John O'Groats to early, had tear man declared to stand or fall with Royal Charlie, or so one of the old Jacobite songs goes. But why was the latest sign of the Stuart dynasty such a favourite with the Scottish Highlanders? Did Bonnie Prince Charlie ever have a real chance of gaining the throne of England? Was the decision taken at Derby one of the most important in British history? And what were the consequences of the last invasion of England and the last battle on British soil? With me to discuss Charles Edward Stuart and the Jacobite Rising of 1745, Alan McInnes, Professor of History at Aberdeen University, Murray Pittock, Professor of English Literature at the University of Strathclyde, and Stana Nenadich, Senior Lecturer in the Social History in Social History at Edinburgh University. Alan McInnes, there were five risings between 1689 and 1745 when Charles Edward Stuart launches his campaign. What were the other risings before 1745 and how close did they get? We start with the fact that in 1688, James II was sent into exile after the Glorious Revolution. He was a Stuart, and then what? Well, various campaigners uh, fought on his, his behalf. When he was exiled in 1689... The campaigns were fought mainly in Ireland, but also in Scotland. Uh, in Ireland, uh, we live with the legacy to the present day. In Scotland, the Jacobites relatively were undefeated, but then um, they didn't break out of the Highlands. In 1708 was the next small rising, which was in the aftermath of Union, and that really was more a hiccup than a rising. Uh, 1715 was a major rising, with a, just after the Hanoverian succession, and that was probably the largest Jacobite rising. The largest, can you give us some idea of the numbers? In terms of numbers, well, I think at least 10,000 in the field. Um, 1719 was a diversionary rising back by Spain that ended up in the sort of wilds of the west of Ross, and the final one was, of course, the, the rising that ended at Culloden in 1746. Before we come to 1745, what you, was, was it simply getting a Stuart back on the throne that caused all these other risings? Or did other uh, complementary uh, new factors emerge between 1689 and, uh, and the end of the 1730s? I think the most obvious factor was the Union. And that changed the nature of... In Jacob- 1707. 1707. I mean, Jacobitism in the 1690s was... Active but low key, but and particularly in Scotland, there's a huge revival in numbers, and so the Jacobite cause in Scotland can also be associated with ending the Union, and that is, I think, what gives a particular dimension to Scottish Jacobitism as against English or Irish Jacobitism. Why did the Union between England and Scotland, which you referred to in 1707, which seemed on the surface to be about to benefit Scotland a great deal, open it up to the English markets and so on and so forth, why did that inject such resentment? Well, uh, there's various ways you can look at this. One is it also established Presbyterianism when much of Scotland was not necessarily Presbyterian. Secondly, it led in the short term to economic recession. When you have equal competition between unequal powers, you're going to end up with recession. And I think there's also a certain amount of frustrated expectations. Uh, Stana Nanadich, in exile, what kind of... The Stuarts went into exile, but they took a court with them, didn't they? Mm. Could you give us some description of the court from, say, 1689 for the next 20 or 30 years? It is remarkable that they trudged around Europe with a fully-fledged court. And I read that it was bigger than the court, of the, uh, the court in London. Yes, uh, in the first instance, of course, the court that went into exile were, was very much a European court, and um, the individuals that went with um, James included many of his senior noblemen, British noblemen, who were, were disposed towards James, but also many musicians, artists, the, the sort of um, skilled workers that would be associated with the court. And they went for two reasons, partly because it was quite clear that the new establishment in Britain was not prepared to support an elaborate court, and one of the characteristics of court society as it evolved under the Hanovers is that it was a fairly sort of low-key, cheap court. And what the Stuarts in exile hoped to maintain was a kind of alternative court. And they could do this to a certain extent whilst they were supported by other European powers, and the relationship with other European powers is enormously important. But, of course, that relationship is a political one, and it waxes and wanes. 
And many of the individuals associated with the court in exile found it difficult to support themselves. Finding financial support was always uh, a problem. And they spent a long time in France, but uh, eventually gravitated towards Rome. And a, a very much lower key court was established in Rome, which, of course, is the court that Bonnie Prince Charlie was born into. He called himself, uh, James II's son called himself King James III. How did, that, um, how did that play in, let's call it, Europe? Well, again, it's a political issue. At certain points in time, there are major powers in Europe who are prepared to exploit that. And the whole history of the Jacobite Risings in Great Britain are part and parcel of European politics, to what degree the French or sometimes the Spanish are prepared to lend help. At other points in time, um, the Stuarts were an embarrassment. At other points, they could be used to um, provoke the British, the Hanoverian state. Um, so it really just depended. Certainly the uh, papal state that largely supported the um, Stuarts latterly gave all the honours to the Stuarts. It was in their interest to do so. And the papal state, did that mean that... In, well, it seems to mean, in the eyes of most people back in this country, they were completely bound up with the Catholic cause, which uh, was still a worrying cause for, that's, for English, uh, the English government at that time. For, for British government as yeah. well, and, and indeed for, for most Scots. They were. Um, th I mean, the whole history of the later Stuarts is, is a complex one in religious terms. Um, uh, Prince Charles's brother, Henry, was a senior Catholic clergyman in his career, made a very successful uh, Catholic career. Um, Charles himself, I, I mean, at one point he was an Anglican, at other points he was Catholic. It's very hard to say precisely what their theological position was. But in most eyes, they were a Catholic dynasty. So they settle in Rome, and the young Bonnie Prince Charlie is brought up in, in papal society, in a, a court over the sea, I presume. English, British persons, maybe Scottish, so British mm. persons, would come across and pay tribute and so on. And this was fed, the idea that really he was, the, the throne was his by rights, if only he could go and get it, was fed into him from an early oh, age. Oh, absolutely, yes. And he was very much raised as a European prince, and... In some ways, this was part of his problem back in Britain. His personal style was not a very British style. It was very much a French, Italian, European, courtly style. Can you just do a bit more about that? What does that mean? What's well, the it, it means, I mean, the, the European aristocracy were a very military aristocracy. He was very much a, a sporting man. He was uh, raised in the traditions of hunting, of fencing, of the kind of military... Uh, skills. He was accomplished in music and these various things, which in many ways um, had been downplayed in Britain because Britain as a Protestant low-key court was not providing that kind of patronage. And the British aristocracy were a less military aristocracy than was the case in Europe. His, his manner, his dress, his address was very European and um, he was an enormously accomplished young man, there's no doubt about that, in the European style. Finally, in his education, how did he learn, as it were, the arts of war? He had, yes. He, he was skilled in the personal arts of war. He was not um, familiar with the battlefield, but certainly he was familiar with horsemanship, with fencing and these kind of personal arts which are so important for warfare at that point in time. Marie Piddock, uh, Stan has suggested someone who, uh, just for, for colloquially, will seem very foreign when he turns up. Well, how is his, how is his Eng I mean, did he speak an English or a, with a, a, a tongue that uh, appealed to the people he was about to lead? Um, it's very difficult to get actual direct evidence of Charles's, a of Charles's accent. I mean, doubtless he spoke... Uh, English with uh, with rather rather a strange accent, but he wasn't necessarily an Italian one, because his tutors from an early age had been Scots, um, and uh, he had been raised in an expatriate enclave, and also one which was the centre of um, a Scottish network, uh, not only in Italy but but um, all the way back to Scotland too, because many of the people were related to people who already lived uh, already lived in Scotland, and for example. Um, one of the closest um, associates of the Jacobite court was, in fact, uh, the brother of William Murray, who subsequently became Lord Mansfield, the Lord Chancellor. In fact, the Lord Chancellor Mansfield himself was uh, accused of Jacobitism as late as 1753, but there was only one witness and no corroboration. <coughs> so you, ha you, have, um, you have a network, and that network uh, means that an expatriate community uh, brings the prince up to, um, to express himself 
in a way which is certainly familiar, if slightly strange, to the people he goes to, to, to meet when he returns to Scotland in 1745. It does seem remarkable, doesn't it, before we move on to the landing, which we'll do in a moment or two, that we take 1688, 1689 to 1645, 56 years, something like that, and this mm. thing keeps going for 56 years, uh, that there's still the possibility they can come back. We're in the third generation now, you know, uh, King James II, then his son, and now his son. It's still going on. It is a remarkable sustaining, isn't it, of an idea that a comeback is possible. Well, there's, there are various different aspects to, to this, and, yes, a comeback is possible. In, in Scotland, uh, as Alan's mentioned, there's a continuing opposition to the Union. There's the fact also that there's an economic movement in Scotland from the East Coast to the West, um, imperial trade, the growth of Glasgow and so on, which is, which is apparent by the mid-18th century. There's the fact that excise duties um, hit... Um, the East Coast ports and smuggling itself becomes a politicised a politicised industry in the East Coast. The whole of range of economic and political circumstances within Scotland. In Ireland, there are the continuing religious motivations, the fact that the Irish see the Stuarts alone among all British dynasties as actually rightful kings of Ireland because of their roots in the high kings of Ireland. And in England... Um, Jacobinism is a declining force, but it, but it becomes stronger in the 1740s because of a sense of um, disappointment, anger and resentment at the way that Hanover, which is, of course, an overseas kingdom electorate, um, being ruled by George II, is being preferred to England in terms of uh, foreign policy expenditure and so on, um, because, of course, George II is effectively maintaining two courts, <laughs> uh, the, court, the, the court in London, the court in Hanover, and the, in the interrelationship between Hanoverian history and, uh, and English history at this, uh, at this stage is, is often one which is, which is still neglected. But, of course, to people at the time, they were very much um, symbiotic, linked polities. So he became attractive and glamorised by contrast with the Hanoverians, apart from anything else? Well, he, he, was, very, he was very glamorous personally. Can we come to the landing, then? He lands at Moidart in mm -hmm. Western Scotland and raises his standard at Glenfinnan in summer of uh, 1745 with a 16-gunship, about seven companions, a couple of whom are Irish. Why does he land there? What does he expect to find there? He lands on he lands on the west coast. Um, the western approaches because it's it's the it's the route which is easiest. Where he hopes it's easiest to avoid um, Royal Navy shipping. And where in the West Highlands he expects some of the strongest support. He doesn't initially get um, that support because the Highland chieftains are extremely are extremely wary of the fact he's come without any significant French French aid. Um, one of the paradoxes of Jacobitism in 1745 is that actually the people who come out for Charles, um, without almost without any doubt, are the people of uh, the Central Eastern Lowlands rather than the West Highlands. The West Highlanders were supposed to be the most loyal, in fact, are the most likely to want to either cut a deal or to play a double game. So how did he get them out? And why did they come at all? I mean, he turns up with five or six or seven people. Um, you know, they haven't been around for a long time, these people. He says, come on, we're going to attack London. And I'm not being too colloquial, am I? That's what he says. And, and eventually, the Highland clans do give him the co enough force to start to march on Edinburgh. 2,000 was it turned up. That's what I've read somewhere of the, uh, in one of your sets of notes. Know about yeah. that number? It's probably a bit less at Glenfinnan, but, but, more than, but by that or more than that by the time the march so in So what really got them going is what I want to know. Why did they turn up at all? If they were as leery and as, as wary as you say they were... Uh, and rightly, I think. Why, why didn't they come at all? Well, um, the key moment is really when Camel of Loch Eel is persuaded to bring out the Camerons by Charles, by Charles Edward. And no-one knows exactly what happened at that interview, but we presume that what happened was that Charles promised to recompense him for the loss of his estate in the event of defeat and to get him a senior commission in the French army, both of which subsequently happened. Um, so the, 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 Camer the Camerons brought about 700 or 800 men to the rising at Glenfinnan, which was otherwise largely supported by, Macdonald, by the Macdonalds of Kepach, who were, um, th who were themselves, as it were, a, a, a bandit clan, a clan on the fringes of, of Highland society. Um, but it's thereafter that, that troops start to come to him in significant, num in significant numbers, partly as a result of the existing political and economic dissatisfaction in Scotland. 
Alan, when, by the time he gets to Edinburgh, what are the significant numbers? And how uh, Edinburgh, we, we look at, even now, this castle on the rock, and how can they take that? But in fact, he just gives in, doesn't it, to these people, who, this, this army who turn up? How many are there, and why do they give in? Well, the castle didn't give in. This was the difficulty. They, they didn't? No, the castle, they, they took over what's Holyrood Palace, but not the castle, so they, they centred their uh, effective act, act of government in the Holyrood Palace. But they were able to accumulate... But if it didn't certain... give in, why didn't it hold out? Let me put it that way. Well, it did hold out. Did it? Yes, it so did. they didn't take the castle no, at all? No, they didn't take the castle at all. No, this is so they the... took Edinburgh, but they didn't take Absolutely. the castle? There was no... I mean, the, the castle became a sort of sporting ground, but they, they commanded the effective arms of government, and that's what mattered. Uh, the castle could eventually have been starved out, but it was less important these days just to take castles as to take the area, to, and they, they effectively established themselves as an army of provisional government. They did so also by attracting numbers, but the difficulty is before they gave themselves full time to consolidate in Scotland, they pushed on to England. So it's difficult to say, if you say 5,000 came in. We know from the local newspaper, the Caledonian Mercury, that people are coming in all the time. So this is, it was actually a Jacobite, well, it was, the editor was actually a Jacobite sympathiser who ran some wonderful editorials in the course of the, this, uh, this event, looking back to previous Jacobite history. So there's a rolling effect, and also there's a, an awareness in Scotland that there's a new government. And this there, is there between about eleven and fourteen thousand yeah. under arms At eventually. Least, yes. But the, the, the difficulty is is that there's the, all this pressure to, yeah. for them to march south, even while, as Alan says, there isn't actually there isn't actually time for them to consolidate. There's still enormous yeah. pressure for them to move. Yeah. And it's, the, it's dealing with those competing pressures that is the cr crux of the it's, it's partly to do with time, isn't it? You know, you don't want to be moving south in the winter. And this was largely taking place in the late summer and uh, the whole the whole uh, chronology of warfare in that period is enormously important. Do you think it would have been sensible then uh, for them to have stayed in Edinburgh, consolidated in Edinburgh, waited to get the French alliance, we haven't yet spoken mm. about, get the French alliance properly on board, which was which was promised to some extent and never materialised at all, would that have been, is, that, is that an option that, that should have been considered, any of you? I think that's been considered. I think the other factors, the Jacobites had a game plan that was established in 1707-1708 by Nathaniel Hook, who was an Irishman working in French service. And that game plan was actually successful because it had been used by the covenanting movement in the previous century, which is you don't bother going initially for London, you go for Newcastle. You cut off the coal supplies. This cuts the credit mm. supplies in London, and you create a financial crisis. Now, this is a very interesting strategy. It would have saved, uh, uh, this would have saved, um, shall we say, the tourist board of Cumberland a lot of grief, Melvin. But basically, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the actual attempt to, to, to they didn't really go for Newcastle. I think that was the big mistake was not was to decide not to consolidate in Scotland on the one hand and take Newcastle. Newcastle was. Was there for the taking. But yes, Wade had 20,000 men. Yeah, yeah, well, but, but the mm -hmm. argument is that Wade was not necessarily on the ball. Absolutely. Just a second, yes. but for yes. people who don't know, they, instead of going to Newcastle, they went to the Lake District, yeah. they took Carlisle Castle, and from there they headed yes. towards Derby. They yes. spent mm -hmm. rather too long, everybody seems to think, in Carlisle having a good time. Uh, but they should have gone for Newcastle, you think? Well, no, I, I, I think that they probably, they probably should have gone for London, which is, which is the, the, the route they took. The one thing is, I mean, the, the, Alan's case is certainly arguable. It was Newcastle or London. Um, they had an army of 20,000 men to face at Newcastle. It was badly led. It had low morale, but at that point it outnumbered them, uh, they had outnumbered them four to one. So they chose to go on the West Coast route to London, and uh, they had to do one or the other. Staying in Edinburgh was not an option. Mm -hmm. The power of the Royal Navy, and more importantly, the huge financial um, resources of the British state would destroy them the longer they stayed in one place because the, the, the rising was underfinanced from the beginning. Alan yeah, shaking his head. I, I agree partly, but I think we overestimate the Royal Navy. In the northeast ports, you actually have 30 ships, I think 28 to 30 ships managed to come into the northeast port despite the Navy. Uh, these are, and so I think the difficulty is where. There's the real heartland is arguably the northeast, and the failure to consolidate mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And also, what we also have to remember, uh, Melvin, is there's also Swedish backing taking place as well as French backing. So you can argue to hold on just a few more months in Scotland, because there was no real reason. The campaign season was not the best time to go into England. The French would never have sailed unless there was sign of a, of a threat to London. And the, the, iron, the great irony of the Rising is that they were they were close to actually mounting an invasion when the Jacobites with Charles decided 
that, that he was lying and there was no chance of the French Mountain invasion because there was no Jacobite intelligence and no connection the between French, the two arms. The French causing trouble. I know. They, we're, <laughs> we're, they come to the French at Derby, if you don't mind, because it's clearer. They yeah. won the, the, the Jacobites won a battle at Preston Pans. Was yes. that, an import, that was always nice to win, but was it an important battle to win? It was an important psychological mm. battle to win. And, of course, Preston Pans was the Battle of Edinburgh. Mm. Uh, Alan is right, you can sit in the castle uh, forever, but the castle does not defend the capital city of Scotland. It is, you know, the castle and the city are quite detached. Um, so the decisive psychological victory was Preston Pans, which is just outside Edinburgh, towards Musselburgh. Um, but thereafter, in a sense the com competing advice and the competing misinformation that this army was dealing with, it, it really was a, a set of options, none of which really was ideal. The great thing is that everybody knows he gets to Derby with the army. Uh, he's penetrated, he's gone an awful long way from Moidart. Uh, and London, by comparison, is not a long way off, and it's fairly flat land and easy to get, comparatively. I um, mean, Dr Johnson walked, they did, from Litchfield, near, 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 nearabouts. So um, we add Derby. Now, where are the French? What are the options? And did he take the right options? Let's talk about the French, because he... Uh, Prince Bonaparte Charlie always said, I've got the French on side, they're going to join in, they're going to come over. Uh, and, that, and he shuffled between raising people on the back of the French and getting the French interested because he had the people in Britain on his side. So these two, he was playing these two, I presume, against mm. each other. Where, let's talk about Derby. Where were the French when he got to Derby? Um, they were at Bologna, mostly. Um, but they, uh, the Jacobite army at Derby had, had hard that Lord John Drummond, who commanded the, the Scots of the French service, the Royal Scots, had landed at Montrose uh, towards the end of November. They, they had no good, proper intelligence and they mu much overestimated the force he brought with him, which was about 1,000 men. They thought it might be four or five times that number. And what, where are the French here? I mean, in terms of, are they, do they figure in the equation when they're sitting down at yeah. Derby to cru uh, crucially to decide what to do? Uh, there, there is, a, I think, another issue of the strategy here. I'm not totally convinced that the French would have backed them because the French knew that if the Jacobites had succeeded in taking London, they're just replacing one major British power with another. So therefore, for the French, there's also an argument to say, stay in Scotland, it's the back door, it's a source of trouble, and you're going to expand the campaign. So, you know, there are various arguments that could be used here uh, the Derby issue, I'm, you know, I'm unconvinced that they should have gone as far as Derby. I would still suggest they should have stayed. You wanted to stay in Scotland. And I think going to Derby. I think the other argument as well is if you're going to mount a successful invasion from France, it's very difficult to take up parts of England. Where are you going to land? I mean, the Norman Conquest did it. William of Orange, William of Orange did it, but nothing the in between. The plan is to, yeah. la is to land in Essex, yeah, and to land and to land Irish and Scots in the French service, ten thousand yeah. men to support an attack on London. That, uh, but, I, but I think that there is, there is an additional dimension, which is the double-mindedness of France on these issues, mm. and that is that the, at the same time they want to split up Britain into... They want to split mm. off Ireland and Scotland. That is a re recurring theme throughout French policy in the 18th century. They see it as a way of, of, of preventing uh, Great Britain becoming top nation, which it almost certainly was. Mm. But they, on the other hand, um, they are... Uh, the move towards London was necessary to actually bring out sufficient French collateral because otherwise but they, all they would do was to drip-feed troops into the East Coast ports, just as 50 years later they drip-fed troops into Ireland in 1798. The, the, the paradox was that if the armies stayed where they were in Ireland or Scotland that the French were supporting, the French never sent enough men Mm. And if they actually, and if they actually yeah. advance towards the heart, towards London, yeah, you know, the <laughs> difficulty, face other risks. The difficulty in all of this is that the French support. If you stayed in Scotland, consolidated in Scotland, it's a different argument. The towns that were not Jacobite, like Dumfries and Glasgow, were prepared to pay the taxes. They're prepared to pay, accept this army of government. Now we've also got to bring in the Scandinavian side. I mean, the Swedes are prepared with French backing to send a fleet. So the fleet that's going to come from there is going to be of no use in Essex, but it's going to be of considerable use in Scotland. So there are various factors that apply here. Stana, where, where, um, uh, what, what's your perception of where the French are? Because they're the, they're the great um, possibility, aren't they? They're the, sort of, uh, they're the ghost at the feast. Uh, uh, what effect did it have on the Council of Derby, the decision they made as to whether to go, whether or not to, 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 attack, to attack London? Well, I mean, the French situation is, of course, always built around French foreign policy. And French foreign policy 
uses the Jacobite interest in very variable ways through time. At that point in time, of course, the French were themselves involved in a major European war, as was Britain. So that this was merely one aspect of the, the very complex situation that they're dealing with. And when it comes to Derby, it is quite clear... Well, two things are quite clear which shapes the Jacobite decision. Not only where are the French, but where are the English? And it is the English support, or the absence of it, I mean the tangible English support, that is the critical issue, because the Scottish Jacobites had marched, intending for London, expecting to gather tangible French support en route, but also expecting to gather up an English army, and that just didn't happen. There's always one other factor, believe it or not, that comes into this. Is both in the 15, but in the 45, there was a major outbreak of cattle disease in the south of England. And if you look at the local press, there's a conviction that this cattle disease can also spread to humans. Now, if you've also got a lot of Highlanders coming down there, their whole trade is based on cattle. Mm -hmm. So you reach Derby, it is just also the limits of the cattle disease, and you can find, actually, <laughs> seriously, you can find I in the whole areas in Essex. <laughs> the lot. So the French could be bringing with them foot and mouth or something. <laughs> <laughs> so there actually is a, whole, there is a cattle... And Bonnie Prince but, Charlie and the foot and mouth disease. Bonnie Prince Charlie foot and mouth. A new, mouth, a yes, new reading, yes. yes. so, Bioweapons. But there is, right. there is this issue of, yeah, bioweapons. There is this issue that comes in the press. It's a serious issue that of, of the cattle disease. It's affecting decisions. But there's where the English, Stana pointed out to where were the English. The English hadn't joined uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie in anything like the numbers anticipated, nor had the Welsh. But where are the other English, they must be presuming? Where's the English army? Now, we know they're uh, crossing Europe fighting a war, but they're, they're, they're a very good army. And they're, they're, they, the, the, the Bonnie Prince Charlie's advisers must think, well, they, they, they've heard about us, they're going to come back and, have, uh, and tackle us quite soon. What was the... Level, what was the level of communication? What was the level of intelligence going on at this time? Oh, it, I mean, in, intelligence systems and spy systems in the 18th century are astonishing. And, of course, the, the very sophisticated misinformation being spread about. And one of the factors at Derby is um, quite deliberate misinformation about the, where the British troops at home, the Hanoverian troops at home, because there were lots of Hanoverian troops based in Britain, as well as the ones fighting in, in um, the... the um, uh, there's a war in Europe. And, of course, British troops are not just English troops. They, they are an enormously... Co it's a very, very complex army. Um, but... Um, what's, count the, what's the misinformation? I think people will be interested in that. The black propaganda, what are they putting uh, out? Well, they, they, they are literally... And who is the they? Who are we talking about? The British are putting out black propaganda. Well... The English. Uh, I don't know the, where we are the now. The British, the it is the British <laughs> state. They're all doing it. They're yeah. all doing it. Individuals are doing it. Um, individual spy masters, the British state, the puppet, the individuals who are controlling the different regiments. And th there are often um, regimental setups that were not necessarily in good communication with one another. And single individuals could be sent in to spread misinformation, even amongst the just the ordinary troops. But, you know, the, the whole thing works on rumour and... Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, panic. I mean, there's this, there's this argument, which may or may not be true, that, that a, 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 a spy called Dudley Bradstreet mm -hmm. came into the Jacobite Council at Derby and said that there was a third army between them and London. They knew that, they knew that Cumberland had come back from the continent. Um, they knew that Wade's army uh, was in the north, but, they said that there, but Bradstreet allegedly said that there was a third army between them and London, mm -hmm. which wasn't true. There were only about 1,500 to 2,000 troops mm -hmm. actually guarding guarding London, and a significant portion of those were the Black Watch who were stationed in the south of England throughout the campaign because they weren't trusted after they muted in 1743. So, I mean, in, that's the, the paradox of Derby is that the route to London lies open, but, it, but a single piece of misinformation may have stopped that appearing to be yeah. OK, decisively, in each of you, and then we'll move on, why did they turn back at Derby? Why did they not move on to London? Just briefly each. Alan, with you. Surely, I think uh, quite clearly Charles did not have English support, and the, particularly the, his council of war, led by Murray and supported mainly by the clan chief, decided that they'd gone as far as prepared to go. The argument was, why should they come into England to put somebody in an English throne when nothing was happening and they could consolidate in Scotland? So they turned back on the basis that there was no English support. Murray, what, what's your view? Is that the same? Uh... Yes, but they also turned back because they, they, they knew that French troops had landed in Scotland and because in the event of failure of the Rising, and some were already, Murray included, believe, beginning to believe that it would fail, uh, they overestimated the extent, this is very important, to which they would be safe. Because in 1715, 
uh, and in 1708 they had been safe. When they got back to Scotland. Yeah, Scottish civil society had really refused to take... Mean, uh, to cooperate with meaningful, strong action against the Jacobite leadership in Scotland. And this was not to be the case after 1745, but they thought it would be again. They thought, if we lose, there isn't a price to pay. Um, and that was, that was a significant motivating factor. It must be said about the English support, though, one of the peculiarities of these campaigns is that in 1651, on the march to Worcester, Charles II got hardly any more English support than, than, than his... Um, uh, great grandson managed on the route to Derby in 1745, um, and uh, you got gobbled as well. <laughs> no, well, but the point is, the point is that to, the, the the point is to estimate to estimate um, support on the basis of who turns out is a, is difficult in the case of England, where it's a very non militarized non militarized yeah. society. But also interesting is the fact that Jacobites always overestimate how many they will get, even though in 1651 you'd have thought they'd have turned out quite a few. And you, Steiner, why do you think they turned back from Derby? To consolidate their position. Uh, I mean, uh, Prince Charles was dismayed by this decision. This was not what he wanted to do. Um, but but the Scottish Jacobite leaders knew that they had to go back. They had to go back for their supply lines, to re- re-equip their troops, to avoid having a campaign over the winter months, to, to really reposition themselves and then see what was possible. Now, Murray's made, I think, a very good point, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, t- I'm sorry, uh, that after 1715, when far more Scots had, had, had been in a rising and they went back to Scotland, Scottish civic society absorbed them and the... And the, the the British army, led from London, mm. was not allowed to persecute them. Now, this was going to change. They didn't know it was going to change. They started to go back, and Cumberland, uh, obviously Hanoverian himself, the Duke of Cumberland, uh, went after them. Uh, did they get a whiff of the fact that they were really uh, on the run then? They, they, did, they didn't settle at Edinburgh, as Alan would have loved them to be in Edinburgh to this day, but um, they didn't settle there. They kept going, didn't they? They were being pursued in a way that had, they hadn't anticipated. Well, is that right, Sonny? It is, it, I mean, I think psychologically, as soon as you start to go back along the route you came, it, it is bound to have an effect, even though it may be a strategic retreat for uh, the purposes of consolidation. I think they were quite dismayed when they got to Glasgow, they um, arrived at Glasgow and found that Glasgow is a very sort of Whig, Hanoverian sort of place, very much the sort of city that Murray's described, being involved in the Atlantic trades, a very modern kind of city, were just not interested in the Jacobites. I mean, they were pushed on very quickly. Um, and then, of course, there's a battle which... Um, um, uh, 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 Falkirk, Stirling, which, in theory, they won, but many of the Jacobites involved thought they had lost... And at that point, a number of uh, Jacobites va- vanished but back th- home. It was a terrible muddle. The, 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 I think the key with, the, with Falkirk is that after Falkirk, Murray wants to retreat. And in order to force retreat, Murray exaggerates the rate of desertion. And when they get to Creef, they find out that far fewer have deserted than Murray has alleged. But at this time, Murray, this time comes the idea that, that Murray has betrayed mm. the cause because he's decided, basically, to throw in the towel. Yes. He yes. thinks that they can't, they can't move back on Edinburgh. It's wooden trees at the moment. I, I just want to get to Culloden and then yeah. talk to come sure. back to Bonnet Prince Charlie. They retreat there. They decide to turn and fight at Culloden. Why did they decide to fight at Culloden? Why did they feel they had to? I think that was very much Charles trying to reassert his position over uh, Murray and the decision. It, I think it was a disastrous decision for the choice of the battleground. It did not, I think, suit the terrain of the army. But one other point to follow up from this, the, all the way out of England, there's also... In the press, you can begin to see this deliberate disinformation that the Jacobites are offering no quarter. There's a, there's a conditioning that's taking place that Cumberland is doing all the way through, particularly in, in the north of England, mm-hmm. with the suggestions that the Jacobites are just killing people for the sake of it. So there's a preparation, there's mm-hmm. a build-up. And the choice of Culloden really plays into Cumberland's hands. And I think it's... But this time also, the command structure is, 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 is in disarray. There's inadequate concern given to logistics... At least two thirds of the army is not properly equipped or ab- able to fight. They pursue a crazy night march um, and call it off. And so, therefore, by the next day, when they, it's this really unprepared army which chooses their own battle site. And uh, this is, I think, where Charles Edward Stuart is its most indictable, was this actually mm-hmm. Culloden. When they did that the night before, they, they were going to do a night march on, on the billets yeah, yeah. Or, uh, the, where the Duke of Cumberland's troops were stayed. It seemed, it, in paper, when I read it, it seemed like a good idea, but then they, they, they pulled out of that. Why did they pull out? They, one of the reasons they pulled out was that the marching rate of the regulars they had was slower than the marching rate of the clansmen. 
and there's a gap started to open up between the clansmen and the regulars, which was so large that the regulars, could, the regulars that they could never have reached Cumberland's camp in time, and so the, the march was called off. It was march over rough ground in the dark. There were different rates of... <laughs> they also, there was also a real problem that some of the troops had not been properly fed for several yeah. days, and they were quite uh, debilitated. Now, Culloden, uh, as I understand it, was a battle that lasted for 40 minutes and uh, appalling, t- dreadful tactics and a comparatively very efficient British army led by Cumberland. Um, after 40 minutes, 2,000, as I read, of the 5,000 were killed and the rest turned and some fled and some actually, one or two regiments actually marched off the field in, in, in good order and kept marching until they got back to base. What, what scale of... How would, you, um, how would you describe the scale of this defeat, uh, Stana? Well, I mean, it is, it is a significant defeat, um, though it's fair to say that uh, some of the Jacobites and Prince um, Charles Edward himself hoped that they could regroup, and this is one of the reasons why he remained in Scotland. Of course, many of the Jacobites uh, exited very, very quickly from some of the East Coast ports. Um, but in terms of numbers, one, one thinks of some of the earlier great battles with which Scotland's been involved, like um, Flodden Field. I mean, nothing like the, the numbers of dead that one's seen in other battlefields. But, of course, for the Jacobites, it is decisive. How significant is it for Scotland and for the history of Britain as, as a battle, then? It's, Murray, it's the, it is the end of any armed insurrectionary attempt within mainland Britain to... Um, break up the polity of Great Britain as it was constituted in 1707. Um, it's, it, it, is the, it is the end of a, a long transition also in Scottish society between the Reformation of 1560 and 1746. It's the end of religious wars, wars over who shall be king, what the church shall be, and whether there shall be unity in Scotland and England. It's that decisive. I, I would agree. I mean, but of hindsight, of course, that's absolutely clear. Mm. There was also at least a, a, a large force of Jacobites meeting at Ruthven just after Culloden, but they'd lost the will. I think this is the really important thing. Culloden sapped the will of the Jacobites to continue, and that is what everything else falls into place from there. Now, two things briefly to talk about. One is the retribution wrought by the Duke of Cumberland, who became known as Butcher Cumberland in some areas. Can we, first of all, Stanley, can you give us some idea of what scale you think that was on? It was pretty nasty. It was pretty nasty, even for the day, so that the title but- Butcher Cumberland was one that was used in England as well. Because he mean, thought of these people as being treasonable. Treasonable, as indeed they were, in, in, in terms of the, the standard Hanoverian legislation. I mean, it began with killing um, uh, injured, injured soldiers and people around the battlefield, execution squads on the battlefield, um, very swift pursuit and um, retribution against those who had given uh, shelter or succour to uh, Jacobites. And, of course, it became far more systematic, far more planned and spread throughout the whole of, particularly the highlands of Scotland. Well, I agree. I mean, I think there are two tactics that have to be realised. It's not just killing people directly with a bayonet and etc. Mm. There's also the deliberate tactic to starve out areas, mm. to remove all livestock, to remove all support of life. And that's, you know, we know that from the present day and, and, and the Balkans, etc. The same tactics are used. Mm. So we have this double policy. Uh, it is not fully effective for a variety of reasons, none, not least of which is some of the decency of some of the British officers who refused to comply with some of particularly uh, the Earl of Loudoun, who was the effective commander in Scotland before Cumberland came back. I mean, he did not comply, and we know from his letters, he didn't, and incre- increasingly there's letters from Cumberland to say, don't distinguish between Jacobites and their potential associates. He did not comply with these orders. Mm. Murray? I think, um, I think the crucial thing is that from the very start of the reprisals, um, certainly after the, the killing on Culloden, there's a separation between lowlanders and Gaelic-speaking Highlanders, which wasn't present in the actual Rising itself. So in 1746-7, you get Jacobite disturbances in Montrose and in Aberdeen, but these are treated far less severely than they are in the Gaelic-speaking areas of Scotland. It's almost as if they are regarded as the, uh, as the core outsider and they are being stigmatised. The rest of uh, Scots, many of whom did support the Jacobites, have been drawn into um, the, uh, the British polity. It's only those who are most different in customs, manners, language who are, being, who are being blamed for the whole Jacobite escapade. 
One of the uh, strangest things of all about this is to, to, to Baraldry that, that Bonnie Prince Charlie manages to drift around Scotland for five months after the defeat of Culloden, protected, some, one of the ballads says, by an entire people. Well, he must have been protected by a great number of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and eventually he dresses up as the maid of Flora MacDonald and over the sea to Sky and so on, and quickly becomes, uh, even though on the, uh, uh, in Europe he ends up very drunk and uh, very debauched in many ways. Kripley becomes a great mythological hero. I've got a pile of ballads here written about him. We haven't time to sing them all, unfortunately. <laughs> I wanted to hear her accent. Uh, and, and still to this day, and yet he'd led people to carnage. So what are we doing? That The protection and then the mythologising, Alan. Well, the analogy would almost be like the aftermath of the American Civil War. The Confederacy have the best songs. They've got the romanticism connected with it, and so it's the Jacobites. And, but they were both... The defeat of both was essential for the emergence of the British and the American state. The reputation of Charles after Culloden has certainly suffered, and I think it was only in his latter years we can go all the way to say that he was a drunken bum lying in the gutters of Rome. But that was put out. He, was, he also was actually seriously considered at one point as the new king of America. The Americans at the time discussing the Constitution thought about bringing him back as a steward. So he was still... And my continental colleagues tell me that things like Freemasonry, which are big, uh, greatly associated with Jacobitism, he retained a leading role in European society through this. So, you know, I, you know I'm sceptical of the British propaganda, particularly against him from the systematic in the 1760s. And latterly, he ended fairly ingloriously. But I think we've tended to see the death of him or the default too soon. And are you surprised at the protection afforded him by the Scots in those five months? It's a long time. Because uh, obviously I, I would guess Cumberland was after him, wasn't he? And Cumberland and his force, and you've talked, Stanley, mm. you've talked earlier about spies, intelligent networks mm. and so on and so forth. Well, lots of people were after mm. him. But, but in a sense, uh, th- those who protected him, lots of people did protect him, they were, they were often quite equivocal about it. And uh, there's an interesting story attributed to Flora MacDonald that in her later experience when she was in, in London as a prisoner, she also became a bit of a tourist attraction. She attracted interest. Mm. And the Prince of Wales... Hanoverian prince visited her and asked her how she could do what she did, and she said, "I would do the same for you." What else if, was she going yes. to say? <laughs> it's going to get her out, going to get her out a lot well, of quicker. She's, isn't she's, it? A clever, she's a clever woman, yeah. um, but but in a sense, they didn't have much option because what were you going to do? And uh, the poor man, and one has to be quite sorry for him, was uh, drifting around um, the, the Western Highlands and the Islands, waiting for a boat to meet up with him. There were a number of French boats trying to connect with, with him, but, but uh, it took a while. So we begin and we end with a boat. Well, thank yes. you all three very much indeed for uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie. And next week we'll be talking about the myth and reality of the search for the Holy Grail. So there we are. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.